A few episodes ago, we looked at the vacuum tube and how it brought its radio. The vacuum tube was the first device that was able to amplify a signal, but the vacuum tube was bulky, inefficient, and fragile. They were just what we needed to get sound off the ground, but eventually their disadvantages caught up with them. We needed something better, and that's what we'll be talking about today. I'm Alec, and this is Technology Connections. So let's recap what the vacuum tube is, does, and how it does it. The vacuum tube is an electronic device that is able to control a large current flow with a small voltage. By placing a voltage on one electrode of the vacuum tube, electron flow is stopped between the cathode and anode. These vacuum tubes are called triodes because they have three electrodes. These were the simplest vacuum tubes capable of amplification. See, when the cathode was heated by a separate heater filament, it started to sputter electrons off from it in a process known as thermionic emission. In a vacuum, electrons are able to travel freely, so the glass tube doesn't have any air inside of it. Well, actually it has a very tiny amount of air, but not enough to matter. The positively charged anode would attract these electrons, and thus a current traveled from the cathode to the anode. But in between these two electrodes was placed a control grid, and when a voltage was applied here, the electrons could not get through. Therefore, you could turn off the flow of electrons by placing a voltage on the grid. The miracle of the vacuum tube was that only a very small voltage was required to stop the current flow, and you could have quite a large current depending on the design of the vacuum tube. Therefore, with only a small signal, you could control a large current and create a new, stronger signal. This is what's called amplification, and it was immensely important for radio and sound reproduction in general. Without electrical amplification, we never would have been able to make electrically recorded discs. Magnetic tape recording wouldn't have happened either. And without amplification, the loudspeaker and the high fidelity concepts that we enjoy today wouldn't have happened. But the vacuum tube simply wasn't the best way to amplify a signal. Because of their heated cathodes, they were very inefficient and they also got very hot. They were bulky and fragile, and in order for further innovation to happen, a better solution was needed. What would eventually succeed the vacuum tube was the transistor. Rather than rely on a heated cathode and an evacuated envelope, a transistor uses a semiconductor to accomplish the same task that the vacuum tube did. Semiconductors are materials that, at the time, weren't well understood, but research was quickly being done. The first person to come up with the idea for the transistor was physicist Julius Edgar Leilenfeld. He filed a patent for a field effect transistor in 1925. While his patent was certainly a big deal, he never made a working prototype, and thus you could say he didn't really invent the transistor. The people that are generally given credit as the inventors of the transistor are three engineers who were working for AT&T's Bell Labs. John Bardeen, Walter Bertain, and William Shockley were these three individuals. Between November and December of 1947, they experimented on crystals of germanium and found that when two gold point contacts were applied to the crystal, a signal with a greater output than the input was created. These new transistors work in a similar fashion to the vacuum tube. When a voltage was applied on one contact, it would allow current to travel between the other two. The simplest forms of transistors were essentially the opposite of vacuum tubes. The vacuum tube would block current flow when voltage was applied to the control grid. However, a transistor will only allow current flow when voltage is applied to the control. Different types of transistors work in slightly different ways, but it's important to understand that by controlling a voltage on one of the contacts, you could control the current going between the other two. These three contacts are called the gate, source, and drain. In the case of an amplifying transistor, a voltage on the gate can control a current between the source and the drain. Transistors were a huge deal because they could be made much smaller than the vacuum tube, they weren't fragile like the vacuum tube, and they didn't waste as much energy because they didn't rely on a heated cathode. Transistors eventually took over the role of vacuum tubes, and for the most part this was a good thing. Now the biggest thing that transistors allowed to happen was miniaturization. Until the transistor was invented, anything to do with portable sound was really a misnomer. Here's an example. This is a Zenith transoceanic radio set. This is considered portable, or at least it was. This radio weighs about 20 pounds, and if it were loaded up with batteries, it would be even more. It's about the size of a large briefcase. Today, we would laugh at how not portable this thing is, but the vacuum tubes and other electronics inside of it forced it to be this large. The transistor allowed for very small battery-powered radios. These, not surprisingly, began to be called transistor radios. These transistor radios would also last a lot longer on a set of batteries because they were much more efficient than their vacuum tube counterparts. 
the transistor allowed for amplification circuitry to be placed in smaller places and do more things. At first, these transistors were wildly expensive compared to the vacuum tube. But eventually, the transistor became much cheaper than the vacuum tube. And once the transistor became cheap enough to be commonplace, a lot more innovation started happening. I want to take you back to the reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder we were looking at earlier. Notice how it's labeled solid state. Solid state was a term that described devices that used transistors rather than vacuum tubes. The name originated due to the fact that transistors were made of solid material. The electrons in a vacuum tube went through, of course, the vacuum, but in a transistor they travel through the solid semiconductor, hence the term solid state. I didn't mention it when we first looked at this device, but the tape recorder is of course using transistors. If this machine was still using vacuum tube technology, it would be much larger and it would also create a lot of heat. But thanks to the transistor, all of the electronics required to run the tape recorder can fit inside on just a few circuit boards. The first tape recorders had gigantic cabinets. Oftentimes the mechanism of the tape recorder was located in a different place than the electronics. So we can see how the transistor was able to shrink things down to much more manageable sizes. And then we got into another interesting innovation. These tape recorders were capable of high fidelity sound, but they weren't exactly portable. Magnetic tape had plenty of advantages to the conventional disc, but people weren't willing to take these massive machines around with them. Also, handling the tape was rather difficult. The tape is somewhat fragile, and having to thread it through the machine is always a hassle. How could we get the best advantages of tape without all that mess? The answer came in the form of a tape cartridge. The first well-known tape cartridge format was this, the 8-track cartridge, introduced in 1964. The formal name for this format is Stereo 8, and it was created by Richard Krauss working for the Lear Jet Company. Its original intent was to be used in cars, where the vibrations of the road made the idea of a portable disc format nearly impossible. 8-track tapes use a loop of tape on the inside, and they actually record four different stereo programs on the tape. They're called 8-track tapes because there are 8 tracks on the tape, with 4 pairs of stereo track making up 4 programs. By placing the tape in a cartridge where you wouldn't have to touch it, many of the complications that magnetic tape had compared to the disc were eliminated. Let's have a quick look at the 8-track. Eight 8-track eight players of the time, for the most part, could not record. They were relatively small and they had a pretty unique feature to them. Because the cartridge has a loop of tape on the inside, the tape couldn't go backwards. However, those different programs that we talked about could be accessed at any time. The way this worked was that, say the entire tape was 60 minutes long. This would be broken up into four 15-minute programs. The actual tape loop was only 15 minutes. Each of these programs ran next to each other, and depending on which program was selected, you would hear the tracks on that program. The way that the player accessed each of those programs was mechanical. There's a small mechanism inside that can realign the head with the tape to select a program. Much like how the big tape had two sides, this tape has, in a way, four sides. However, rather than flipping the tape over, the heads move to each next pair of tracks. A foil tape at the end of each program signals the player to switch programs automatically. If you listen to the entire tape, then the tape loop has gone through the machine four times, once for each program. Now this had a couple of disadvantages. Because the head physically moved to access different programs on the tape, the head could rather easily get out of alignment. But the bigger disadvantage was one of fidelity. The narrower the tracks are on the tape, the more noise there is. This is because there's less potential for signal on a smaller space, and the noise becomes a bigger part of that signal compared to a wider track. So the quarter track tape that we looked at before had tracks that were twice as wide as the 8 track. This meant that the 8-track sound was, by default, a little worse than standard tape. The one thing that the 8-track did well was that it used the 3 and 3 quarters inches per second speed. This is the middle speed of our quarter-track recorder, and it was pretty common for use in music. But the biggest disadvantage was due to the infinite loop of tape. Because of the design of the cartridge, again, you could not run the tape backwards. If you had just passed your favorite song on the tape, well, you'd have to wait for the program to go all the way through. Some 8-track players, like this one, allow the user to fast-forward the tape. It generally only ran the tape at twice normal speed, but it still allowed you to get back to the song you wanted a little faster. The 8-track would eventually be succeeded by, well, sort of an accident. The compact cassette, designed by Philips, was meant to be used as a dictation format. It was actually released two years earlier than the 8-track, in 1962. The tape was never meant for music because the tape traveled at only 1 and 7 eighths inches per second, which was simply not fast enough to have decent fidelity sound. Remember how poor the sound was on this machine when it ran at that speed? That's what Philips expected to get out of the compact cassette. Not only that, but just like the 8-track, the tracks on the tape were half the width of a typical quarter-track recording. 
In order to have a stereo recording on two sides of the tape, the tape had to be split into four tracks. And since the tape width of the compact cassette was half that of the 8-track, the tracks themselves were the same size. So now we not only had a slow tape speed, but for stereo sound we also had the high noise of the 8-track. But these limitations were not long for this world. In a short period of time, the compact cassette was able to improve its fidelity beyond the 8-track. Perhaps the biggest help had to do with the better tape formulations. The general purpose audio tape used in the days of reel-to-reel -reel recording was great for using at high speeds, but at low speed it sucked. By creating a better audio tape, the slow speed of the compact cassette was no longer the limit to fidelity it was. Also, the high noise level brought about by the narrow track would eventually be dealt with by Dolby noise reduction. We'll explore noise reduction in a separate episode. By the early 1970s, the cassette tape began to be a rather commonplace format for music. And once this happened, the 8-track started to quickly disappear. The 8-track cartridges were bulky and much more cumbersome to use than the cassette, which could be fast-forwarded and rewound. Plus, cassette tape lengths of up to 120 minutes were common. 8-tracks were never that long. The cassette tape success was cemented by Sony's invention of the Walkman in 1979. The Sony Walkman was the first truly portable music player. Now not only was the compact cassette competing against the vinyl LP for music distribution, but if people went with the cassette, they could also take it on the go. For now we're going to stop here. There will be a separate Tech Explorations episode on the compact cassette as well as the 8-track, and we will explore not only a little bit more of those technologies, but we'll also explore Dolby noise reduction. In the year 1982, the cassette tape was doing great. Special tape formulations and high-end cassette recorders were able to create very high fidelity recordings. Cassette tapes were way better than vinyl in many people's minds in a lot of situations, particularly since they weren't nearly as bulky or fragile. But 1982 brought a new challenger to the horizon. In next week's episode, we'll be exploring the compact disc, and along with it, digital sound.